Greetings, Guardians. My name is Byfear. So, yeah, no script on this one. I just wanted to give you my thoughts and a bit of a hot take on the second week's worth of story in Season of the Witch. As a quick note, I will have some video content out on the little bit of lore that we got from the lore book that is attached to the season, not the Sororicide one, the other one. Because yeah, that contains a really important perspective piece, and uh, <laughs> you're all going to want me to expand on that, I promise you. As a quick note, by the way, spoilers, obviously. If you didn't realize that, then yeah, what are you doing? Also, hi, this is a non-scripted video. I'm trying to make sure that we can get content out well in advance before the raid, and well, I'm also trying to keep up daily content for the moment, so yeah, here we are. But first, life is just a hassle, right? I mean, you come home after a hard day's work and sometimes you're just tired. You've got 10,000 things to worry about and one of those things that you can kind of easily forget is eating something. And you know what? I can't blame you for sitting there and being a little mad at the fact that that's got to go on. You got to put all this effort into cooking too. But hey, look on the bright side. You could always use HelloFresh. Why would you use HelloFresh though? Well, let me tell you. One, all the ingredients are delivered pre-portioned so you always get a good healthy portion without any of the nonsense. Two, you make less food waste, and that's not just good for the planet, but also it helps you save money. Three, on the note of saving money, it's cheaper than that way overpriced takeaway you were thinking about getting. And four, you can pick what you want. There are over 40 recipes each week, and they all have easy to prepare, foolproof recipes attached. And hey, if you don't fancy a full meal, they also do snacks, easy lunches, celebration meals, and they've started adding more options for fresher seasonal ingredients. So you can grab some extra stuff and throw it in a dish when that particular ingredient is at peak ripeness. Do not delay, start saving money with HelloFresh right now. Use my link or go to hellofresh.com and use code POGBIFEAUG50 for 50% off plus free shipping. Click the link in the description, or scan the QR code with your phone. Thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. All that being said, let's go ahead and talk about the second week of story, which I'm tentatively saying was also quite good. Yes, we got the cutscene this time around. Normally these things drop at some kind of big seasonal revelation point, sometime four, five, maybe six weeks into the season, and this time it's dropping right here at the second week. Which is nice for a couple of reasons. First of all, it means that we don't immediately get this thing spoiled five weeks ahead of time, which has always been a problem with the season. And you know, I don't know if that's the reason why it's been done like this, I have to assume not, but if it is, it's kind of sad that this is the way that we have to do it, but it's nice that we're actually getting it and no one spoiled anyone's cutscenes for them. You know, that's real good. So yeah, that's a big win I suppose, but if you're really looking at it from just the pure qualitative standpoint, this was a great cutscene. It breaks down sword logic, it breaks down Eris's motive, it breaks down everything to do with what's happening this season, and why Eris is actually a force to be reckoned with. I'm gonna go ahead and say too, it's a phenomenal storyline based on just Eris's progression alone. Yeah, nothing new here to say on it. Eris, 10 out of 10, all the interactions with her in the story, always excellent. Some of you who may have missed my earlier videos will see that, yes, Eris's transformations into a hive god are temporary. She does so whenever people tithe to her and a ceremony is inducted, but that does not mean that it's happening all the time. All that being said, it is still really good to see that she is able to take on human physical form again because it leads this interesting dynamic into this story, you know, and Ikora mentions it a whole bunch. The transformations take their toll on Eris, that's really quite clear, but also they represent this immediate point of what most people would see as potentially corruption. But I don't think Eris sees it that way. I'm going to go ahead and allow Martin to insert her thoughts here as she says to the Drifter, and we'll talk about that conversation afterwards. So yeah, here's what she said about it to the Drifter. Hey, Eris. Heard we have some, uh, strange bedfellows. Though, if a bedfellow ain't strange, then they're probably not worth having. So it seems. Have you come to urge caution? To advise against temptation? Nah. You know what you're about. 
But I'm wondering, what's it like? It begins as a feral surmise, a suspicion. I hear whispers, but they are in my voice. It rises until I am screaming. I make a demand. An atavistic fear now sublimated into a singular, desperate urge. A hunger I must endlessly sate. But the Hive are not afraid. They are awestruck. They know that I am vengeance. And they have conjured me back with vengeance. Ooh! Sounds like a wild ride. I seek to subvert the Hive's flawed logic. I may only do so because of what I am, and what I am not. It is a wild ride. Hey, I'll be there when you're on the other side of this. As will I. Trust. Whilst it does sound kind of wild and frenzied, it also sounds kind of liberating for Eris. And she says as much when it comes to the earlier conversation that we had with her, just as she was talking about it first. It's something that may furrow Ikora's brow, but for Eris it makes her feel a little bit more like her true self, which is interesting I suppose. Perhaps it's telling us a little bit more about the nature of Eris, but also it seems as though she is still somewhat in control, which I think has to be taken as a good thing. All that being said, the real takeaway from that last conversation with Drifter is, hey, it's good to see that the narrative here is really consistent, and I'm glad that I called it correctly. Drifter is not about to abscond anybody for their choices, he's just here to support. And you know, it's really nice to see them picking up on that point of the trust that they've built together. Again, it's just... I don't know, that speaks to a very healthy relationship dynamic. Drifter knows what Eris is about, and Drifter knows what she knows. You know, it's just a point of saying, hey, I trust you. And perhaps it's also that moment where he sits and says, there is nobody in this world who should be able to judge when someone has gone through as much as you have, and has learned as much as you have from that process. So yeah, really excellent to see that dynamic going forward. I do think there's also a very interesting plot point that's getting inserted here into the story, which is this. Imaru keeps warning us simply that, well, Eris is kind of playing into Savathun's plans. There was a lot of stuff going on within the story, talking essentially about the idea that Eris was part of the plans of Savathun as a means of not only allowing her resurrection to go forward, but also potentially pushing back the forces of Zivua Wrath. There was also this very interesting radio message which was sent along, which is where Imaru basically goes ahead and plays a conversation between Savathun and Zivua Wrath. Take a listen to this, because it's fascinating and a little terrifying. I heard you guardians got a lesson in sword logic today. You think you can defeat Zivu Arath with philosophy? <laughs> right. Let me show you something. Savathun kept records and I took a look at what she had on her sister. Got a recording from way back, just after you guardians dropkicked Oryx into Saturn's orbit. Call it a primary source for your little research project. Spoil 
calls you rotten. Not everyone wants to be like you. And you won't always get your way. I will test my strength against her brood, and she will prove our logic true. Do you see what you guardians did? Do you see what's happening here? Zivu Arath thinks Eris is one of them, some kind of heir to Oryx. That ritual of hers tied a pretty bow on that theory. This is all part of Savathun's plan. But I can't help wondering, what the hell does Eris think she's doing? So here's the interesting thing. This conversation was supposedly taken right after the entire fall of Oryx had occurred. After Eris had allowed the fire team to proceed and then they had gone and killed Oryx. This is a big deal because Toland the Shattered notes that none of the Guardians went to claim that space and he even calls us the Great Squanderers for that. Which is, I mean, perhaps understandable from his perspective and the perspective of the Hive, but here we have Zivo Arath claiming that it was actually Eris who is supposedly going to claim that mantle of the Taken King. And in a strange way, she both has and hasn't. She has become a Hive God and has joined their pantheon. But I don't necessarily think that there is every parallel between her and Oryx. Eris desires vengeance, Oryx desired secrets. These are two very different things. What is similar is the way that Savathun describes how Oryx would approach the problems of the world and how Eris has suddenly become. Both things involve transformation. Savathun in the second entry of the eighth verse of the Books of Sorrow, or the eighth book of Sorrow, not sure how you quite want to categorize that, she basically sits there and says that Oryx's approach to solving all the problems of the universe was to ultimately change himself and adapt as much as he could. In the meantime, you have Eris, who is just sitting there and doing, I mean, not exactly the same thing. She's not adapting to every problem, but she certainly is taking on one hell of a transformation to meet the moment and to face the problem that we all have right now in the form of Zivor Wrath. So in a strange way, yeah, she sort of is mantling the Taken King. Is that alarming? I think it is, but also it's not entirely unsurprising especially given that Eris has made the entire point of her power based on moments of revenge that have been carried out successfully. Crota, Oryx, Savathun, her presence as opposed to theirs is a testament to her power in the sword logic, and it proves her right to be there and to be amongst their pantheon. All of that being said, that's kind of where the seasonal story wraps up. That and with Imaru giving us this little warning being like, Hey, by the way, you're all playing into Savathun's hands and plans here, so go ahead and continue to do just that. All very, very good stuff, and I really do continue to love the characterization of Imaru. But I think there's a bigger point that needs to be made here, which is... This was the second week of a story, and normally at this point, we settle into the routine of please find me my MacGuffin. What I mean by that is, I mean... Take a look at the seasonal story when it came to Season of the Deep, or Season of the Plunder. Those, I think, are the best examples of them. When it comes to those two seasons, it ended up being this case of, okay, we need to collect Arsa's Coral, or we need to collect Nezarek's Relics. You know, there was this very formulaic thing going on with the story, and you could immediately tell where it was all unfolding. This time around, maybe, but maybe not so much. The busy work wasn't as prevalent in this particular second week of story as it would have been otherwise. You had the freedom to go ahead and do any seasonal activity within the bounds that you'd created. It was a way of unlocking more rewards that you could kind of choose, which is not the most fundamentally changing thing of gameplay, but I mean, you know, you still had the freedom to go wherever you wanted. And I think it was better because there was less busy work and there was more actual narrative. I think that's one of the immediate prevailing strengths of all of this. Now, it's very easy to say that when the second week of story is this strong. Normally, we do not get a cutscene attached. We don't always get strong conversations where Imaru is warning us about the Taken King's previous legacy and about how we're playing into Savathun's hands. And we don't always get great little bits of character dialogue. 
where the Drifter is coming along and just asking Eris how it was to wield the power of the Hive and to receive all those tithes. You know, this was a really strong moment within the story because it hits all of those important themes, but also because, again, it didn't feel like it was this monotonous find the MacGuffin game. You know, and that's good. Less busy work, more narrative. However, is this going to continue is the question, because two weeks worth of good story doth not a good story over the entire season make. I'm still reserving judgement for that to really sort of become apparent, but what is clear to me is that at very least if this is Bungie's attempt to try and make seasonal storytelling and the season structure generally a lot less monotonous, so far within these first two weeks it's kind of doing better. If they continue on this trajectory and it continues to go upward, then I think we're doing pretty good. It's also worth remembering that we should look to past seasons and why they were good. And I think the biggest example of it all was Season of the Chosen. The reason for Season of the Chosen being good was that the story evolved every week with the battlegrounds, I think, but also because it had never truly felt like this before. Yeah, it was the first that we'd ever seen, but also the story felt really fresh. Every new battleground came with a new boss that was attempting to join Keitel's legions and claim power with her even more intently than the last, and they all had their own reasons for it. Eventually, it linked into the plot with the Scions as Ixel the Far-Reaching. I think it's Ixel. Maybe it's not. Point is, that Scion was linked in with the group that tried to assassinate Zavala, and after all that had been done, we then actually got the strike itself, the Proving Ground strike, and that was a capstone to the story along with one of the better cutscenes that we'd seen in seasonal storytelling ever at that point. Everything felt like it was actually progressing through the story beats as things went on. And whilst it isn't necessarily the case that the Season of the Witch has strikes to do that, little bits and pieces of the world are changing week by week within both Savathun's Spire and, though I've not played it yet, Altars of Summoning this week. Again, I have played a ton of Altars of Summoning, just not here at Reset. So, yeah, if this continues to be the kind of pace we go at, and if we continue to see changes, that'll be really good. I just hope that they can keep pace with all of this. There need to be some seriously important story revelations to continue onwards with this, because there are just so many strong characters that if they want to keep this beat going, they need to do some pretty dramatic things and have some very important story moments. What those are going to be, I don't know. Will it live up to that particular hype? Maybe, maybe not. We'll still have to see. It's very uncharted waters here. I've said it before when describing the conundrum of Lightfall, but I do believe that Bungie's writers do have the chops. I mean, again, even if you just look in Lightfall's lore content, you see Nezarek within there. Nezarek, which is some of the best lore that we've had in a while. And I think it's worth remembering that, because the writing and the narrative team generally continues to prove that. I think that at this moment in time, we can start to sort of move on from Lightfall, as the mistakes it made are going to matter less and less within the story, and it's also clear that the narrative team has received all that feedback. They're starting to be able to actually enact it now and within this next season. We're going to see the more substantive bits of it in final shape, but for the moment, this feels like it's the kind of evolution and pivot that we need within the narrative. Having said all of that, biggest takeaway of all is this. Regardless of where the narrative sits right now, this is week two. It's still way too soon to judge. I may do these hot take videos once a week to just see where we are with the story, and maybe it's because, well, it's all to do with Hive and Eris and that's just kind of my jam, but I mean, if you guys are all up for it, I'd very happily do so. All of that being said, that's our video for today. If you did enjoy, thank you very much, and go ahead and leave a like. And if you want more Destiny content as well, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. If you have your own thoughts, leave them down below in the comments. Tell me, what do you think of this season so far? I'm personally of that somewhat optimistic opinion, and the strength of the themes is still really apparent but I want to see that continued deviation from the theme of Find the MacGuffin. 
If they're able to do that, I will be very happy with this season, and I will be glad. To clarify that as well, I think it's okay to find one important item or one important relic, but the eight relics of Nezarek that perfectly tie in with eight weeks of seasonal story is not what we're looking for, you know? At that point, there's no meaning to it. Not to mention that if you're actually adding in a relic there, it should actually do something. It shouldn't just be the thing for the reasons of having the thing. I think that it needs to have an actual tangible impact on the plot. I mean, let's say... Hmm, this is kind of throwing things around there. But imagine if Eris at some point unlocks a new chamber within the Oubliette, and she just so happens to unlock something wild and radical, like a copy of the Books of Sorrow that actually has different details to it, that show different parts and pieces to the Hive's story as they might have been. That throws a whole new context on the thing. Maybe that's worth guarding, maybe there's something in there that's so revolutionary that the knowledge is wounding to Zivu Arath. Who knows? The point is, if we're going to sit there and introduce a thing, an item, a piece of information, an article that everyone wants to chase and is after, Let's make sure it has an actual narrative purpose. If we can do that, I'm really confident that the story will actually be set into a decent place. Anyway, long spiel over. Know that as per usual, your viewership, as always, is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.